Hello, everyone. My name is Sondo Sisawa. I'm an associate professor at University of New South Wales, Australia. It's my pleasure to introduce today's event. It's a webcast and a panel discussion as a part of a series on the eight grand challenges in social environmental modeling. Three organizations have joined forces to bring us to you today. These are CISINC, the National Social Environmental Census Center in the US, TS, the Integrated Assessment Society, and SESMO, the Socio Environmental Systems Modeling Journal. The series is about the status and future of socio environmental systems modeling, and it's based on an article that I have led as a co author. It highlights the current challenges and articulates the ways forward. The very first of these events was a webcast and panel discussion where we presented an overview of the grand challenges. And you could download an open access paper. We will drop the link in the, in the chat box. And you could also view the video or as a part of the first webcast where I presented an overview of the grand challenges. We will also drop the link in the chat box. I am delighted to present today's presenter, Ian Beckis. Ian is the Vice President of the Integrated Assessment Society and was a senior project leader for DBL, the Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, where he specialized in assessing and processing environmental information for decision making. Since 2010, Ian has been assisting the China Council for International Collaboration on Environment and Development as a member of high-level task force and policy studies. Ian has extensive experience in kick-starting and supporting broad-based assessments and future outlooks for OECD, the World Bank, and UNEP. Today, Ian will talk to us about a very important topic which is introduction to uncertainty, transparency, and robustness in socio-environmental systems modeling and assessment. So please sit back and enjoy Ian's presentation. Good evening, uh, or good morning, depending on where you are. Uh, in this webcast series, we add an important and relevant aspect to the article on the eight grand challenges. The article approaches the topic from the perspective of SES modeling. And as an example of SES modeling exercise, imagine constructing an outlook of coastal developments and nutrient loading in the Baltic between now and 2050. That gets you into SES modeling involving the behavior of farmers, of fishermen, and of people building holiday homes, and the somewhat special stratification of water in the Baltic Sea, and the changing nutrient mobilization as climate changes. And this is an example of SES modeling that I will be using this evening. The value of these webcasts relative to the Grand Challenges article is a bit of reflection based on the application of these models in assessments. For example, the UNEP GAP report is such an assessment. And in case you're not familiar with that, the UNEP GAP report is the annual report that evaluates the commitments of governments worldwide to address their greenhouse gas emissions and com comparing this progress with what should be done. I find the UNEP GAP report a good example because it is focused on a particular policy question and it applies modeling as well as qualitative information on the firmness of these commitments. And it has a due date. Assessments like these provide a helpful perspective on the grand challenges because they rep represent a thematic focus, a user and a commissioning body, and priority questions that need to be addressed. Then on notions of uncertainty. In this webinar, we address uncertainty issues in models and in assessments in a wider sense. That means that our conversation may touch upon the following aspects. First, transparency of models and of assessments. 
Transparency involves documenting and providing open access to modeling characteristics and, and its assumptions and documenting stakeholder engagements process and ideally also the workflows and the coding. You could say that this addresses uncertainty of what is in the model and what the assessment is based upon. Can we trust it? Whose world view do we have here? Sufficient transparency is needed in terms of workflows, open access models, and stakeholder engagement. Who was involved be becomes a relevant question. For example, imagining a specific model based green energy plan. Have nature and landscape NGOs been involved? Or is this just, you know, the brainchild of wind turbine enthusiasts? Then next, bias and limitations. That is a more specific case of trans transparency, you could say, of, of and about uncertainty of what is in this black box. Any model or even an assembly of models has a certain bias and has limitations. And an assessment perspective enables you to say whether or under what conditions an analysis using a given model, given its bias and limitations, is fit for the purpose. That would be in the light of the purpose defined for the assessment. For example, if that model-based study on the Baltic that I mentioned only served to place on the agenda that climate change will speed up the pollution of the Baltic with nutrients from animal farming, then a limited and somewhat old-fashioned representation of agriculture is not a problem, as long as the study is transparent about that. The study then will always show that climate change will increase the nutrient loading and that something needs to be done in time. But if that model is meant to explore response options and explore burden sharing, then these limitations would need to be addressed before the model can support policy discourse. Then techniques that identify uncertainties that matter, for example, sensitivity analysis, can be useful because they show where to focus and reduce uncertainties or to co communicate the uncertainties. And one of those techniques is sensitivity auditing that, as described by, by Andrea Saltelli, who is in our panel this evening or today. But sometimes uncertainty is precisely what an assessment is all about and therefore something to be embraced and not reduced. For example, in assessing the viability of a regional development strategy vis-a-vis -vis uncertainties in migration projections, or in an outlook of managing river areas in times of climate change, considering the uncertainties in regional climate projections. Like when stress testing a financial institution, in these cases, uncertainty has to be placed center stage. Then on addressing uncertainty in practice. In relation to uncertainty, the Grand Challenges article that Santos mentioned and on, this, on which this webcast is building makes three points. And I'll share my screen for just two slides. First, and this is the, the uh, mind map, you, you could say, of the article on the eight grand challenges. Um, and on this topic of tonight, integrated treatment of modeling uncertainty and uncertainty in assessments, the article makes two points. One, there's limited adoption of integrated uncertainty of assessments in practice. And that's although there's a whole toolbox of methods available. And also, although there's a toolbox of methods available, there's also limited communication of uncertainty to decision makers. And then a second point that the article makes 
is this. It underlines that every step in developing and applying your model does something with uncertainty. It is not just the data or decisions about scale. It is also conceptualization, the context, and the original purpose of the model versus what it is actually used for. And this is a slide that Sondos showed in the video that goes with the article. And um, I can re recommend that if you want an overview and a download link should be in the chat box. And a third point the article makes is based on this, the, art, the authors of the paper plead for addressing uncertainty in SES modeling in an integrated way. Uncertainty in all its aspects, including bias, and addressing it as part of the whole modeling process. And I would add, and as part of applying models in assessments. On the toolbox, the article features an overview of 16 methods that can be used for dealing with uncertainties. And some of these methods are themselves packages of methods. For example, multi-model analysis to illustrate the impact of different model structures and assumptions. Or, in addition, an uncertainty matrix to prioritize crucial sources of uncertainty. Or the new SEP method, and P is for pedigree. Uh, Arthur Peterson will refer to this when he speaks as member of the panel uh, a little bit later. And finally, as a last example, the uncertainty audit. And I find it very interesting because it can serve as a process to involve stakeholders in uncertainty matters. In other words, much has already been done in this area. And in fact, the examples I mentioned, the four, these four, were published between 2003 and 2007. And still, we should be humble and learn to apply these methods. And that applying available methods may be just the thing. Some of these methods listed in the article are not exactly rocket science and amazingly still not applied by everyone. For example, a good visualization of model outputs or assessment findings that is a powerful tool in detecting questionable statements. And still I have been amazed by important practitioners not using it. And just as an example from my own experience, PBL, the organization that I um, have been working with, and OECD collaborated on analytical work for the OECD Environmental Outlook to 2030 and later to 2050. And that was heavily based on detailed modeling. OECD did the economic modeling and PBL did the biophysical stuff. And I was on both sides. OECD ran its very detailed economic modeling featuring sectoral and regional shifts on production as well on the consumption side. PBL, before taking those projections as input for its cascade of biophysical models, ran the OECD projections through its visualization routines. And they said, hey, what is the story behind this remarkable revival of manufacturing in Russia? Or same thing in Mexico. And how many enterprises are we talking about? And what would they produce? What's the story? And OCD usually said, oops, give us a week and we will look at it again. And to OCD's credit, I must say that three years later, finalizing the outlook when PBL cranked out numbers about nutrient loading on marine, marine coastal ecosystems, the OCD team then responded by saying, hey, these are beautiful graphs and maps, but what's the story? So this was a successful missionary work. And then before going to the panel, I want to highlight four specific aspects that came up in, conver in conversations with the panelists for this series before today and consider them personal remarks about things that I'm interested in. Four points. Focusing on robustness of conclusions of an assessment 
has been suggested as, as an elegant way to keep communication with users short, to the point and service oriented. In other words, would the conclusions of this assessment have been different had we used a different model or different indicators or a different reference year? Reporting on robustness only addresses questions of certainty and uncertainty that matter. And I hope Arthur Peterson can, can tell us more about that. And I, in case he doesn't, I just say that I think this is one practical way forward. Second point, and in contrast, full transparency rather than this focused communication about robustness is being demanded by a classical school of critical reviewers of models and assessments. Detlef van Vuren, who was on the panel on the overview two weeks ago, expressed reservations about the information value of full transparency. But at the same time, he commented that without that, your model efforts would be dead anyway. I'd say that you probably still want to know the discount rate governing any cost benefit analysis. But is full transparency realistic and desirable, considering that even medium complexity models are becoming quite large in themselves? And that current assessments, in turn, routinely combine multiple models. But is progress in standardizing model descriptions of any help here? Uh, if so, to whom? Third point, what about consistency between the various assessments that are compiled for or on behalf of one and the same body? For example, the European Commission or the Chinese government. Can you add those assessments up and then expect a meaningful picture? Last point of these personal points of interest, I wonder whether comprehensive reviews of models and of their use in assessments can help the analytical teams concerned to do a better job in addressing uncertainties and determining robustness. And already in 2007, Jens Refkaerts pleaded for model auditing and expect extended peer review. But serious audits of models do occur. And these are labor intensive events requiring documentation of important applications of the model, of the issues encountered, and of development choices considered. Imagine something the size of a book or a special issue of a journal or a new wiki site of your model or all three. And then a review committee has to be composed and has to do its job. I wonder if the effort in conducting these reviews can be harnessed in a more strategic way and can be used for communicating the results slightly more broadly. Against this background, we are lucky to have three panelists who first are prepared to make themselves available in busy times and second can speak from practice. Then this distinguished panel of Europeans, um, a bit late in our evenings. First, Andrea Saltelli. Andrea has been referred to as the godfather of global sensitivity analysis. He is the lead author of a recent manifesto of five ways to ensure that models serve society, published in Nature. And that has everything to do with, and perhaps even summarize, summarizes the eight grand challenges. There's a link in the chat. Andrea is now with the Open University of Catalonia in Spain. He's originally from Italy and until recently was teaching in Bergen in Norway. Then, Veronica Gaffey, she is our super user of model-based assessments. Veronica is the chair of the Regulatory Scrutiny Board. And that, with its fantastic name, is an independent body of the European Union. And perhaps Veronica will tell you more about it. She's nodding. Every initiative for new regulation in the EU must undergo an ex and assessment of its impact on all the objectives of EU policy, including the environment. And modeling plays an important part in this. 
the board that Veronica chairs has to make sure that these assessments are not merely window dressing and the board is tough. See its latest annual report and a link to that too should also appear in the, in the chat. And if you want to situate Veronica on the map, first take Ireland, then take Brussels. And thirdly, Arthur Peterson, first active in the Netherlands, and now nowadays Arthur is with University College London. He has doctorates in many things, is involved with interesting journals, and at UCL he teaches precisely on the topic of today's webcast. I mentioned the overview table by Saunders and others of 16 methods to examine uncertainties in modeling. Arthur led the work on one of these, namely the idea idea to focus on robustness of the conclusions of the eventual assessment. And then of all the uncertainties identified, which ones could change the conclusions and therefore do matter, question mark. With that, over to the panel. Um, Andrea, um, first the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and uh, thanks for Sandos for preparing this interesting uh, paper which we have read and uh, with the eight grand challenge. Uh, uh, time is uh, rather short, so I think I uh, will uh, jump into the presentation uh, uh, immediately. Uh, I want to share with you the screen. So this is, this is it. Oops. Share. Okay, now I have to send it to full screen if I manage. Minimize this, full screen that. Okay. Okay, so uh, uh, I will be talking about a modeling manifesto, trying to also find linkages between this work we did and the work of Sandos and, and, and co-workers. Um, uh, in case you're interested to some of the paper I mentioned, uh, this presentation is already online on my website, which is simply um, identical to my name. So it will be very easy to find. Uh, so the PDF corresponding to this talk is already, is already there. Um, so this is uh, uh, the, the manifesto, uh, which as you can see, has very this uh, fantastic illustration from David Parkins, which is one of the best uh, draftsmen of, the, of, the, of nature. And the occasion for this uh, manifesto, which was surprisingly for us published by nature, is, was uh, the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, because with COVID pandemic, uh, modeling uh, jumped through the roof in a sense. They really uh, jumped through the, uh, to the limelight, you know, capture the headlines. But let me say first a few words about my uh, distinguished co-authors. They are a quite uh, interesting bunch of assorted scholars. We have two sociologists of quantification, Wendy Espelan and Theodore Porter. We have two statisticians, uh, Deborah Mayo, and, um, uh, and uh, Philip uh, Stark. We have uh, modelers, statisticians, stat activists, uh, one philosopher, Jerry Ravitz, uh, uh, you know, really a, a distinguished group of people, uh, three STS scholars. This is also interesting because the paper to a certain extent has uh, this imprinting of uh, science and technology studies scho scholarship. So as I said, COVID-19 brought uh, the models to the to the limelight, to the to the limelight, and this uh, comes with, resp with responsibility, power, and also conflict. The power is obvious because apparently these models were instrumental in taking an important decision. You, I'm giving you the a title from the New York Times referring to the Imperial College report, the virus re report that jarred the U.S. and the U.K. to action. So really, you know the. It is communicated that it was the model uh, which did the trick to change um, the policies of uh, Trump and, 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 and Johnson. Uh, but then together with this power came the criticism that uh, the computer program, the code which was used to reach this conclusion uh, uh, was not a code for policy decision, was rather poorly documented, quite obscure. So there were a lot of discussion you know, in, in, the, in the blogosphere about whether this code should have been used for this uh, purpose. And there is this discussion and some of these computer code are like Chimelon. They pretend to be uh, for study, but then they are used for policy. But if someone complains, they say, oh, come on, this is only for study, <laughs> you know, this kind of uh, shifting behavior. 
Uh, conflict. Well, conflict can be pretty serious. You know, uh, Trump was still um, president, of course, and this is one of his uh, supporters, a uh, journalist, Rush Limbaugh. Uh, he said uh, he was very much against mathematical modeling and said, why does COVID numbers? The minute I hear anybody start talking about models and modeling, I blanch. Uh, so you see quite strong, uh, you wouldn't expect mathematical modeling being <laughs> taken into the conflict in this way. But this is not only Limbaugh, because you have here uh, a scholar talking about mathematical models as public troubles. You know, because of course, uh, people complain that mathematical modeling highlight certain things while hiding others. And the discussion to a certain extent still goes on. Uh, we had in the, in the manifesto one period which attracted some fire, uh, especially from some in the modeling community. And this was modelers must not be permitted to project more certainty than their model deserve. And politician must not be allowed to offload accountability to models of their choosing. Uh, for those who were in the UK, you may remember the furious discussion when, when, when Johnson said he was basing his action on science and the scientists said, no, come on, this is not our job. This was your job. You cannot base your work. Uh, you, we are not dictating what decisions should be taking. We are only informing those decisions. But um, I, I think I will stand by this period even, uh, I would write it again. Uh, so we now come to the, to the rules, the five rules, which as uh, Jan has mentioned, uh, resemble a bit uh, the prescription of sensitivity auditing, which is a generalization of sensitivity analysis. The first rule is to be very clear about uh, the assumption. And the way to be clear about the assumption is to propagate uncertainty and estimate sensitivity. Uh, and this should be a must for any mathematical model. I believe that producing one single crisp estimate from a mathematical model is in a sense unethical once we know that all the input are, are uncertain. Uh, then we have a second rule about uh, uh, tuning the complexity of the model to what you really have because complexity can be the enemy of relevance. And this is perhaps the most technical part of my short speech. Uh, modelers are normally seduced into uh, be building larger and larger model because they do this in an attempt to capture reality more accurately. Uh, but they are also aware that uh, while you decrease uh, the error due to, to the model non-adequacy, you increase the error due to the propagation of the parametric uh, error because you have more parameters, each parameter is uncertain. The more of them you have, uh, uh, the more uncertainty you build up. So there is a kind of uh, ideal minimum in this curve, which is the point where you should stop. Now, I know that this is a point which is uh, furiously contended. Uh, this is uh, called uh, the O'Neill conjecture. Some people call it the uncertainty cascade. There are several names in the literature in different uh, disciplines. The plot I'm showing you now, which is uh, of a paper in progress with one of uh, with several of my collaborators led by Arnald Puy at the University of Bergen is to use a metafunction approach showing that depending on the K is a number of parameters, depending on the cardinality of the problem and depending on the uh, non-additivity of your model, so how many interaction, you can have more or less of this kind of uh, uh, um, effect of increasing uncertainty. But in general, you do have it. Um, then we have the issue of framing. You have to match purpose and context because as uh, Jan just said, model will reflect the interest and the disciplinary bias of those who develop them. Um, and this is an important uh, issue to be revealed to those who uh, 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 use the model. You know, those like Veronica should be aware of what, what the, where the model is coming from and what were the motivation of the developer. And we are keen on that because, I mean, for people in my community, this is a tautology, but the technique is never neutral. No, uh, if you listen to, to Ulrich Beck, who was a sociologist of science already many, many years ago, he said that uh, you can practically already decide what the outcome of a study will be by knowing which discipline 
will be applied or which methodology will be applied. If you use cost benefit analysis, you will already know what kind of outcome will, you will have. If you use multi criteria analysis, of course, you will have another one. Okay, this is a, a, a simple example, but if you want, uh, and this is also uh, the same argument is uh, done in the famous book of Gian Domenico Maglione. Um, so the mind the consequences, this is something which, uh, uh, well, this is very dear to uh, Sheila Jasanov. She has, uh, maybe you have read her work on the technologies of humility, which I think is also quoted by Sondos. Um, so you must be aware of who, we, who are the winners and who are the losers of your modeling process. Also because we learn from sociology of quantification that numbers are seductive, performative, they confer legitimacy. And if you want to use number, you must be able to enjoy the trust of those who receive them and the opacity uh, damage trust. So we may go back to this conversation later on. Uh, a classical case for this is uh, mathematics. Uh, many people have objected that we have been experiencing an excessive mathematization of economics. I cannot go through uh, <laughs> all of these authors, some of which are even my friends. Um, I, Paul Romer is not my friend, but Paul Romer is a macroeconomist and he wrote a, a paper on the mathiness in the theory of economic growth to make the point that some of his colleagues use mathematics to hide normative uh, position. And uh, Philip Mirowski, of course, even more, <laughs> even more uh, heavy on that. Um, and then, of course, the last, the last rule, if you wish, the last uh, which we have is uh, to be candid about the ignorance. And in fact, this man, Antonio Fauci, has been my hero because there is a video on YouTube, you can see. Uh, uh, there is a politician in the American Senate, I don't know where, in one of the chambers of the US legisl legislature, who is probing him for a number, how many people will die, how many people will die. And then he says, no, there is no number answer to your question, because of course the reply depends on the path, no? on what we shall do between now and, and the number of years time. So this is uh, capacity to accept uh, uh, ignorance. You know, the docta ignorantia of Cusa is mentioned in the paper. So when I compare the work done by Sondos and the work we did, we cover a lot of common ground. So for Sondos, we, the objective is to achieve informed, equitable, and empowered decision-making in the eighth challenge. We uh, insist a lot on the concept of responsibility. Uh, in particular, we insist on the need to domesticate Reciprocal, let me say, reciprocal domestication between models and society, because society is getting a lot of modeling and is not prepared for this kind of uh, uh, new uh, kind of interaction. So we think that more work should be done there. Um, so I'm really trying to keep this uh, talk short. Uh, what am I doing now after the manifesto on nature? I've been working with a group of people uh, at UCL, not in the same institute as, uh, uh, as Arti, but uh, in the institute uh, led by uh, Mazzucato, Innovation Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Uh, and with that, we broaden a bit the discussion from, uh, from um, mathematical modeling to quantification in general. We believe, this is a difficult point to describe, but we believe that if you compare metrics, ranking, indicators, even in artificial intelligence and, uh, and algorithms, there are lots of commonality. But this is a, an important discussion, but we cannot do it now. Uh, why do we do this? Because we think that something which might be useful to do would be to create some kind of a European observatory on quantification, where we investigate you know, different instances of either incumbent or uh, being generated uh, uh, quantification on the fly, try to, to unpack them, to, to see what is inside and whether we can trust them or, you know, or they are instrumental or, or whose instrument is that we are looking at. I, I finish here. Thank you, Andrea. Um, before Veronica, let me say two things. One is um, that we will collect questions from the audience in the Q&A uh, channel. Um, and try to group them after the three presentations by the panelists. Um, the second thing is alert to a useful 
posting in the chat by Jeroen van der Sluis about the supplementary material to the manifesto. So for those who want to download, you can use that link. Then, just, under, just let me say that this is yeah. very good for uh, the educational purposes. I wanted to mention that I forgot, especially in your work on the eight grand challenges. For the educational uh, material, this uh, supplementary material can be useful. Sorry, Jan, I interrupted you. No, no, no. Okay, that, that was a useful addition by uh, one of your co authors. Um, Veronica, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Jan, and uh, good evening, everybody from Brussels. Um, I'm delighted to be here, uh, even if it's rather late in the day. Um, but just it seemed to me such an interesting topic that I couldn't resist uh, to participate. So maybe a word about the Regulatory Scrutiny Board first. Um, and I saw that very helpfully the, our, annual, our latest annual report has been uh, posted in the chat, which was published two weeks ago. So if anyone's interested, you can see more there. So I'm the chair of the Regulatory Scrutiny Board of the European Commission. The board was established by the president of the commission in 2015, but it replaces an earlier impact assessment board, which had part-time officials of the commission um, assessing impact assessments. But the, um, the Regulatory Scrutiny Board uh, has myself and six board members who are senior uh, officials of the Commission. Three come from inside the Commission are, and three are recruited from uh, outside the Commission. And we basically assess all impact assessments and selected evaluations. And it's all impact assessments of initiatives that are likely to have significant socio, uh, social, economic or environmental um, impacts. So maybe just a word first to situate us about where we come in in the process. Our role is to support decision-making by the commission. So um, our role is to assess that all proposals are based on the best available evidence, and that includes the modeling, the research, stakeholder views, et cetera, and that that comes forward with uh, a series of options for action uh, which can support policymakers to make a decision. We advise the European Commission before it adopts a proposal. There are, of course, a, a quite a number of procedures that take place afterwards, and those of you who maybe are less familiar with the European approach may not be fully aware of this, that the Commission has the right of initiative, the Commission makes the proposal, but after that, the proposal goes to the co-legislators, which are the European Parliament and the European Council. And there's quite a, a process that goes underway there where there might be some changes. Um, and then of course, after a proposal is adopted, it may well be transposed into national legislation. So we are at one point in the system. And the idea is that we try to ensure that the commission's proposals are evidence-based and of a good quality. Um, we have some powers. If, um, if we give a negative opinion on an impact assessment, the uh, Director General responsible must go away and do more work in line with the opinion that we have um, delivered and they must resubmit. When they resubmit an opinion, we scrutinize it again um, we don't do this very often, but very occasionally we give a second negative opinion. If we give a second negative opinion, the proposal may proceed, but the Commission must explain publicly why. Um, the other thing about, and uh, is linked to, we were talking already about transparency. When a Commission initiative is adopted, the impact assessment is published at the same time, along with the opinions of the regulatory um, scrutiny board. So just in terms of um, scale of work, you'll see in our annual report from last year, we assessed 41 impact assessments in 2020, and we gave 46% of them an initial negative opinion. Um, we, on the resubmissions, we gave them all um, a positive or positive with reservations on resubmission. In one case, we gave a, a second neg negative, but exceptionally, we agreed to look at it a third time because we're gluttons for punishment. Um, so 
As uh, I think has been explained, uh, and Andrea referred to it as well, I'm not a modeler, but I am a user of models and I see how they are used in the, in the policy making process. And that's what I propose to focus my short comments on. Basically, an impact assessment should help inform political decision making. It should therefore be concise and have a good narrative. And actually, uh, Andrea made a good point there. I think that good narrative also includes appropriate visualization. Um, and this is something that we've seen sometimes as a, it becomes a problem because uh, especially in impact assessments, which are based heavily on um, modeling, you can end up with an impact assessment that is nearly 200 pages long, that's full of technical formulae and has zero narrative. And really that is not performing the function of supporting the political decision-making process because basically nobody's going to read them. The only people who will read them are our are, are fellow, fellow modelers. Um, so modeling is useful, but it should not determine policy decisions. It's one input into the process of an impact assessment. Um, and it should be clear, I mean, Andrea said it in his manifesto there, you should be clear on the, the assumptions that are made and the uncertainties involved and bring those into the equation. Um, the other aspect I'd like to emphasize is that the modeling can't be the only evidence. And we have seen um, uh, impact assessments which have been heavily based on modeling and it's the black box. The model says, so this is the preferred option. And basically that won't get through uh, our scrutiny because that's not sufficient. Um, because you, you haven't been clear on the assumptions, on the uncertainty and the other evidence that's out there. And actually I want to go back to a, a point I probably should have made earlier. One of the most important points in an impact assessment is that there is evidence that there is a problem that needs to be fixed. We see sometimes there are, um, there are initiatives that are announced politically and they go ahead, but there's no evidence that there's actually a problem there. And that's one of the important areas in an impact assessment. It needs to be clear about what the problems are. So basically for me, an impact assessment is an appropriate mix of um, a methodology, data collection, modeling, uh, consultation, um, supporting studies, and all brought together in a way that creates a, a clear uh, narrative about what's the problem and um, what are the objectives, what different options could actually uh, meet these objectives and address these problems, what are their impacts, and um, what are their impacts on the the different um, stakeholders involved? What are the impacts on member states? What are the impacts on, um, on business, on SMEs, on the environment, on, um, on households? Um, these are all issues that need to be uh, addressed. Um, so maybe one of the most impor important things we see recently is, and Jan mentioned it, is the issue of um, coherence. Because increasingly we are seeing that proposals are all more and more interlinked. If I think back to my early days in the European Commission, I joined the European Commission in um, 2020 after spending 14 years in the Irish administration. Um, and back in the, 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 the noughties, if you like, every DG in the Commission they had, they had a cupboard with lots of proposals in it. And every year they used to come out and have more proposals. And the idea was let's have more legislation, more legislation, more legislation. And uh, then the impact assessment approach was put in place. Um, but there was still this business of DGs working in silos. I think the Juncker Commission really tried to make a, a change in behavior and talked about legislating where it's important. But the change with the von der Leyen Commission is everything is connected to everything else. Um, 
So if you take the main priorities of the von der Leyen Commission, the Green Deal and digitalization, even they are connected to each other. And then if you take the Green Deal, um, you can see that uh, the, the, the linkages between them are, are, are between the initiatives are, are phenomenal. So uh, that really changes how you approach the impact assessments. We became aware uh, last year when we looked at the impact assessment for the um, climate target plan in the summer that everything was going to be all connected. Now, the modeling was done very well um, in the sense that they took a broad picture but then we realized that when it came to the impact assessments for each of the, uh, under the Green Deal, there are about 12 legislative initiatives that we're, we, we, we've been look, we're in, the, in the middle of the process of looking at. So um, we, in our upstream meetings with the Commission Services, we started tell, talking to them at the end of last year and say, you, you're going to have to work together. You're going to have to work together to think about, um, your baselines and basically you, they needed to have a common modeling framework for the whole lot um, so the timing of the different initiatives the baselines the implications on the timing of the initiatives so if one initiative came in first and there is a political decision on that how does that change the options and decision making for uh, an initiative that comes a little bit later on. So this is something that um, we, we found, we, we really stressed to the Commission services, but it's something that um, actually they, they have taken really seriously. And we've really seen in the last year that the Commission services are working more and more closely together. Not saying we're, we're, we're totally there yet. I was a bit surprised when Jan in his introduction talked about the coherence and consistency, and he was comparing the um, EU to China, but there you go. Um, wh what we did find was that some of the uh, initiatives focused very much on the modeling, and the modeling ended up being the black box. And we've really gone back quite strongly to the Commission services, and we've said, no, no, you need to develop a narrative. You need to integrate the, uh, the other types of evidence that there is. And uh, what, what we actually found in, in some of the initiatives was that they, they had done the stakeholder com consultation and they had analyzed it, but they didn't integrate it into their analysis, which would have given a stronger qualitative dimension to the impact assessments, which would really have helped to create this narrative um, through the evaluation. So I'll stop there because I think I'm out of my 10 minutes. So yeah, over to you. Thank you, Veronica. Um, if we have time, I, I can come back to the point, your point about China. Um, okay, Th thank you very much explaining the power of rigorous analysis. Um, we'll take questions later on for the three panelists to, together. Um, finally, Arthur, um, it is your turn. Um, please pick. Uh, the topics that you want to comment on. Thank you very much, Jan, um, and thank you very much all the uh, to all the other um, presenters and and panelists. Um, it's a little bit of a trip on on memory lane, which you will uh, see shortly. Um, in terms of work uh, that I've been involved in since the uh, the early two thousands in, in in preparing analysts to do the things that we are still asking them uh, to do. So it's so important um, to keep stressing um, that it's important to properly deal with uncertainty, to be transparent about assumptions uh, that are made, um, and then also about what's the impact of all that on the reliability or robustness of uh, assessments. Um, and this may help to increase, in a sense, um, the robustness of findings or shaping findings in a way um, that, that have a kind of uh, higher robustness than if you wouldn't pay attention uh, to, the, uh, to the uncertainties um, and, and to the assumptions that, uh, that are underlying. Um, and this is the case in any assessment. Uh, today we're focused on the kind of the link between modeling, social uh, environmental system modeling um, and, uh, and assessments. 
Um, and what is crucial is that uh, the messages that you craft, um, that they are really uh, in an assessment, uh, are really uh, commensurate uh, with the remaining uncertainties. And, and, and as we just saw from the comments uh, from, for instance, uh, Veronica, it is not always the case that it seems that those uh, findings that are communicated are indeed commensurate um, with the remaining uncertainties. So let me um, share with you, um, first of all, my screen, um, and then tell you a bit about what happened um, in the Dutch government setting, um, in the situation where we were in um, uh, after a crisis in the Netherlands on, in the 90s on the credibility, public reliability of environmental modeling um, as it went into uh, decision making. And that was the time in 2001, subsequently, I joined uh, the precursor of the PBL, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency, and I benefited a lot from a project that had already started and, and that was running and that I became, uh, let's say, a co-worker uh, with, uh, by Jeroen van der Sluis at Utrecht University, was contracted by the Dutch government to, uh, to help the PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency in its dealing with uncertainty. And this is all relevant for this question of today of how to deal with uncertainty, transparency and robustness. So what was developed, and I will uh, put in the chat a link to um, the, uh, the product that came out in, first in 2003 and then a, a second edition in 2013. Recently, it has been incorporated in reports about science advice to the European Commission. Um, and so it's, uh, it's still alive as a state-of-the-art uh, document representing uh, how to do uh, well, science uh, policy, the science policy interface well, uh, given uncertainties, particularly modeling uncertainties. In terms of what is involved in the practical crafting of messages that are robust, there are several um, foci that come into play um, that you really have to focus on in order to get to those messages. Uh, that you can uh, that you can trust, and it's not only about um, uh, steps of doing calculations and trying to quantify the uncertainties, and then having uh, a range, and from that simply determining the reliability, statistical reliability of your of your findings. It's much wider, and we learned. I learned a lot from uh, from the crowd that Jeroen was working with uh, from uh, post normal science that it's all starting with the larger question of how you frame the problem, how do you define the system? What are the different views on the problem by different actors? What are indicators that you use to show that there is a problem or what the problem is? Um, and then the, what's the aggregation level? That's a very important thing. What's the scale that you're looking at? If you look at a high aggregation level, some findings may be much more robust than if you suddenly zoom in on particular details that are very unreliable. How do you deal with the fact that in many cases the knowledge isn't there to do a reliable assessment? How do you deal with those knowledge gaps? How do you communicate them? How do you do assessments uh, when parts, when models are, um, it's recognized that recognized ignorance of particular processes are, are not in the models? How do you communicate that? How do you deal with that? Um, how do you develop your models? Uh, to uh, further to, to deal with that? But sometimes it's not possible to model your way out of it. And then, of course, you have to use all the tools available for actually mapping and assessing relevant uncertainties. I will give one example um, of the new sub methodology combined with the uh, uncertainty matrix. And then at the end, reporting uncertainty information is not about throwing the uncertainties over the wall. Again, it is. And that's the major lesson that, that we were kind of practicing in the Netherlands Environment Assessment Agency is how can we craft messages that we think are robust? For the uncertainties. So sometimes it's a, a relatively weak message and that's fine if the uncertainties are, are really high. So I just want to show here, not going to any detail, the matrix um, uh, that was mentioned uh, is also mentioned in the paper um, um, as a tool. Uh, this is a tool that can be used by analysts. So this is not for the receivers 
of the um, the modeling information it's for the modelers uh, and the and the assessors to determine where in my assessment do the uncertainties arise uh, what are the different uh, types uh, of uncertainty that play a role here from statistical uncertainty to recognized ignorance um, is there an issue here of uh, a low quality uh, of uh, a model or assumptions in the model uh, is there a bias is there value ladenness that we need to separately address and what we used this for, and that was uh, uh, on the work in the work led by Jeroen, um, is to map all these different types of uncertainty to tools that you can use to go in more depth and analyze those uncertainties in more detail. Now, one of those tools was already mentioned, it's NUSAP. It's a way to qualify quantities. Um, and the N is for numerals, that's numbers. Units is what the numbers are about. Spread is something about a range. Assessment says something about what that range means, but pedigree is the thing here that I want to focus on, which is the underpinning, the quality, the reliability of assumptions um, that are, are, are made in models. And if you combine this with an assessment of how particular assumptions um, have an influence on the outcomes, and if you find that the pedigree, the underpinning of those assumptions is weak, you enter in this very useful diagnostic uh, tool, this matrix, the danger zone. And I just want to show two examples. I'm not going in detail. So this is one that Jeroen did of the timer model. That's a global energy model, part of the image suite of the PBL Netherlands Assessment Agency. Uh, this is one that I did together with colleagues uh, from UCL on uh, the uh, 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 British uh, energy system model, ASME, um, where we also were able to locate particular elements in that model, assumptions, input parameters, for instance, what are the resources for domestic bio energy uh, production in the UK and uh, what is the building rate uh, for a CCS, it, particular assumptions in that model to design the future energy system um, in, the, in the UK. So let me conclude by highlighting what I think are four major lessons from the work that I've done when I was at the PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. I left, I went to university uh, in, in London in 2014. Um, but four lessons um, are the following. Uh, first of all, thinking about robustness is really thinking through uh, uh, uncertainties and value ladenness in a, in a kind of, in a deep sense, um, without throwing away um, what, we, uh, what we can learn from, from normal science. The second lesson is it's not only about robustness of statistics, but it's also about robustness of assumptions of the quality of the methodologies that are under, underlying the model. And of course, also social robustness, uh, having the trust of the larger public for the assumptions and the models that you're building. And thirdly, a major lesson from post-normal science that you have to do extended peer review. You shouldn't just ask kind of your friends from the same disciplines to look at the assumptions in your models. You have to organize a more extended community of peers. And um, that's, that's a difficult thing, but that's one of the most important things, most important lessons that modelers can take away from this. And finally, um, that's something that I find increasingly important is uh, that we, we can call it under the heading uh, acknowledging social complexity. We have to really study philosophically through anthropology um, how social and environmental system modeling is actually being performed and in the context of assessments for policymaker and how that is received. Because I think there's a lot of uh, social science scholarship that can add, uh, and it's not just about deconstruction, it's actually learning what's happening there and that can uh, uh, help us uh, in improving our methodologies. So that's what I wanted uh, to share, Jan, um, as part of my uh, short intervention here. Thank you, Arthur. Um, useful to have a memory lane. Um, after these three comments, um, you're taking uh, questions and answers from the um, questions and answers channel. Um, Caroline and I will read them out. So the, here's one on artificial intelligence. Could we not use artificial intelligence to model rather than resorting to parametric modeling? as we may not fully know how to make use of the parameters in this kind of modeling. 
or we may end up over parameterizing the problem. And continuing on, how should we assess uncertainty with models based on artificial intelligence? This is a question by Shiv Prasha. Does anyone want to tackle that one? Uh, I may uh, give a short try. Uh, I've been, you know, this is a big discussion, artificial intelligence and algorithms. And uh, uh, I was just reading a book of... Uh, uh, Luisa Amore on that, uh, but I, I probably won't find it uh, now, no, <laughs> typically. Uh, uh, so uh, the point is that uh, even uh, uh, when you have this kind of deep learning algorithm, there is a lot of uh, curating of the data, statistical analysis of the data. Uh, uh, a lot of information goes into how you train these algorithms. And in this training, lot of bias comes into, you know, you may have seen, uh, like you may have seen this book, for instance, you know, uh, 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 weapons of mud destruction. So very often this uh, uh, deep learning algorithm under the veil of neutrality, uh, in fact, embed a lot of uh, bias, including gender bias. You may have heard about uh, uh, the movie coded bias and uh, uh, the, the Algorithmic Justice League in the USA and uh, Octavia Caso Cortes discussing this after this black girl could not be recognized by an intelligent uh, uh, deep learning software because she had to put on a white mask in order to be recognized. So I don't think that this kind of artificial intelligence can be a substitute for understanding of the problem and communicating how the understanding is achieved. And I don't want to make it too long, but there is a long literature also on the mistakes make, making by uh, these tools. So I think one should be careful not to present this as a, a panacea of all problems. Okay, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, Caroline, perhaps you can just take, take turns. Um... I, I spotted a question. Um, actually, it, it's um, a question for clarification, I think. And uh, I guess it would be to Veronica. Uh, the question asks um, uh, how the DGs that uh, describe an initiative pick their tools. And the question also refers to um, it says the European Science Hub, I think it meant the Joint Research Center as a pool um, of models and methods. Uh, but more generally, um, do you have um, insight on how the models and other tools um, are selected? And does that play a role in your scrutiny? Um... Yeah, okay. We, uh, we're not modelers, though we have one or two modelers on our team who are able to really uh, question in, in, in more depth the assumptions, the uncertainties, etc. Um, it Across the different areas of the Commission, there are quite a number of models used. The JRC is really putting an effort in to um, ensure that their models are transparent. I mean, when the climate target plan came out first, we asked that question. We said, uh, where have you published the, the results of your models? They should be available. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm not fully aware of the process whereby the models are decided for the JRC. But I do think the JRC works closely together with all the Commission services. Uh, the Commission services, if they have an area that they are working on, they will go to the JRC and they'll say, they'll work and say, where is, where is the evidence? And they will work with the JRC to develop, um, for the JRC to develop a model or somebody else to develop a model. And if there is a model that is used in the Commission, it is usually made public in this um, MIDAS database. And uh, so it should be, the, the results should be publicly available. Um, uh, but generally we don't, um, 
generally we don't question the model results unless there's something that really is not coming across to us in terms of the assumptions being made, lack of uh, emphasis on, on the uncertainties, or some of our experts are able to see that something's missing. But generally where we come from is that we want to see the modeling results confronted with the other evidence that is available. Whether that is the evidence of the problem that exists, um, but also the stakeholder views, um, has, that, has, the, has the consultation with stakeholders been done uh, appropriately and been uh, reported appropriately? And have they done a, a serious assessment of who will be affected and how, and have they put it all together? That's that's where we come from in the Regulatory Scrutiny Board. Thank you, Veronica. And in addition to your explanation, a couple of people have posted useful links in the chat um, ah, for yes. documents to download. Um, and and um, the chat will be also be saved and made available later. Um, Caroline, have you selected another question? Uh, yes, well, it's difficult, but all worth answering. And so I'm going to take one from an anonymous attendee. Um, what role do you see for mm. non-robust conclusions in impact assessment, given that in science they are useful as hypotheses to guide future work? That's interesting because I had selected that one for the next thing. <laughs> okay. Do, 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 to whom to... do you want to post that? To Andrea, perhaps? Andrea, you want to tackle that one? So the question was about how do we use non-robust inference in the context of decision making? Well, uh, uh, one of the, um, one of the uh, main recommendations which come from sociology of quantification is the right not to quantify. No? Uh, I mean, there should be a point where modelers take the decision not to express himself or herself in number because he believes the results are not enough, are not robust enough to, uh, uh, to be offered as a number. No? Uh, uh, this is also in the book, uh, uh, The Tyranny of Metrics of Mueller. He says, uh, you know, in, many, in some circumstances, the best use you can do of numbers is not to produce them at all. Otherwise, you are confusing the issue. But how do you address then this kind of situation? Well, uh, for me, the, the big solution, well, a possible solution to this problem is to, to change the nature of the question. When you cannot ask the question in the positive, try answering the question in the negative. What do I mean? Uh, I mean that if you cannot prove that something works, um, try to see if some of the policy option you are trying to formulate bump into some kind of constraints, uh, biophysical constraints, availability of natural resources, um, societal constraints, compatibility with existing uh, laws and uh, institution, or simply desirability constraints. Is this what people want? Very often you cannot prove that something can be done, but you can prove that something cannot be done. And this is also a, a useful piece of information. Um, and then, still in addition to what um, Veronica uh, explained, there is not so much a question as a bit of an answer in the um, Q&A um, channel. Uh, and I read it out. It's from Lane Hordijk, who is an authority on this. Um, Lane explains that the Joint Research Center of the European Commission has started reviewing the GSC models that are being used in integrated assessment, in, in impact assessments. But he says the GSC's models are not frequently used in impact assessments and major EU models like the Prime's energy model have not been peer reviewed. While Prime's is being used in any impact assessment that includes energy. So he concludes a long way to go. Um, a couple of things going on there. Um, as a next question to the panelists, um, I'd like to quote one from Margaret Palmer, who is one of the organizers. Um, she writes, it would be interesting to hear panelists talk about 
how to move forward to get more rigorous review processes from journals within, between brackets in place that demand transparency. I think that the question was inspired by Veronica's talk. And how might reviewers and editors evaluate, evaluate that? Um, Let's see, perhaps Arthur, you can take Yeah, it I'm on. happy to come in on this one. Um, so you do see the movement to, um, let's say, open science, to uh, increased transparency, to checking, uh, let's say, statistical robustness um, in journals. Um, what I kind of want to flag is that the thing that I was pleading for this extended peer review is typically a thing that's very difficult for journals to organize because um, they are for most journals um, 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 very disciplinary oriented or they, they have a uh, if it's not disciplinary oriented they have a particular crowd of modelers who know each other and, uh, and, and, and kind of work together and make the same assumptions um, so there's a lot of um, Again, I would say um, sociology of science analysis that needs to be applied here in terms of how does the, the, let's say, the academic industry in that sense work. So there is a very useful role here and there's, a, uh, and there's progress being made and there are journals that are more interdisciplinary um, as well. But I just want to flag that, let's say, um, um, for instance, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in producing its reports um, has a much more extended peer review system than a journal. So many people will criticize the IPCC for, well, this is not peer reviewed literature. Well, it's better than that. It's the best type of peer reviewed literature that you can get because of all these values and interests and stakes have a right to give comments and they can bring in expertise from all sorts of places that you never thought would have something sensible to say, and they do. So I just want to add that element to that question, but it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Um, we should move forward, uh, definitely. There's so much junk science, maybe Andrea can, can come in on that one as well. Um, that's, that's a basic problem in science in itself, not even uh, science for policy, um, but that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, and Andrea, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yes, I cannot comment on junk science, otherwise we start oh. another seminar <laughs> on, non, on non reproducibility is a subject I love. I mean, you know, I, I, it's very interesting, but I wanted to a word of optimism because things are moving, things are moving. Uh, I mean, the movement of open science is uh, eventually hitting also on mathematical modeling. Now it's quite common that you have to produce uh, uh, maybe on some GitHub server or your source code. Uh, together with my co um, authors, uh, Arnold Pui, Samuel Lopiano, and, and Simon Levin, and Arnold is leading this work, we are now trying to publish on the Journal of Statistical Software, whereby uh, on this journal, the editor run your code. And if they don't run your code, they don't publish your paper. I mean, you know, they really want to, uh, I mean, there are things are moving with open science maybe in the right direction in, in this uh, possibility, at least to verify that the code does what it's supposed to be done, to, to be doing. Thank you. Caroline, another question? Yeah. Um, just looking here, the um, question of, um, I'm going to move to a recent question by Nikki Grigg. It's very mm -hmm. broad. Um, it, the question is, in the panelists experience, what are the most significant barriers to applying the good practices they recommend and what is most needed to address these barriers? Now, of course, it, I guess it depends what we're referring to exactly, but there, I'm sure there's no silver, silver bullet. So perhaps you could draw on some examples where you really see that we can have a big impact. Veronica, would you like to take that? I would say from what I have seen over the last couple of years, the biggest barrier is that we have politicians who decide they want an, an initiative and they want an impact assessment and they want a uh, draft regulation and they don't give people enough time to, uh, to do the work. 
Um, now that we saw last year, and you see it in our annual report, we saw it a, 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 as a real problem. Uh, uh, we saw, we, we received impact assessments that were essentially unfinished. We received impact assessments where they had done the modeling and then they rushed to put it all together into a document that was about 200 pages long when it's supposed to be 40 pages long. And uh, you turned the page to the um, section eight in the European Commission impact assessment is the preferred option. And you turned the page and it was empty. So, um, so yeah, so, so we must say we've been engaged in a process with directors general across the commission to say to them, listen, you have to tell your political level, it's not possible to do this analysis in the time that you are giving us. And uh, for me, that seems to be the biggest uh, issue. And um, at least in this commission, I think people are understanding that. They're also understanding it because, uh, yeah, we're, you said it at the beginning, Jan, we're quite tough. We are, even if we see that the commission has planned to adopt an initiative at a certain time frame. It doesn't stop us giving a, a negative opinion if we think the uh, the work is not done to a sufficient quality. And uh, sometimes I come under pressure and they say, well, if we resubmit in three days, will you give us another opinion in three days? And I say, no. I say, I can't, I can't guarantee the quality of the scrutiny on that basis. I'll shorten it from the four weeks we have, but I won't shorten it to three days. Um, so for, for me, uh, that, that, that um, how, how, how politics, time and expertise all come together and the need to be able to give sufficient time for analysis to be done in a sufficient way. That's what I've seen as the biggest problem in, 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 in recent times. Okay. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Arthur, please. And let me reflect on some of my experience uh, in the PBL Netherlands Environment Assessment Agency, where the political pressure, in a sense, was much less. Um, uh, of course, there's always time pressure. There's always constraints. Um, and so, but there are many projects that 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 we in the agency love doing. Um, and then you saw, also in that case, if you had kind of, I would say, enough time, it was an afterthought to think about the uncertainties. Um, it's, 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 they really have to go back then to what's happening at universities in the training, right? Is one of the other questions, which is really important in terms of making it a normal part of your work, spent a decent amount of time thinking through these quality issues. It's not lost time. Um, and, um, and then of course, in, in, uh, and, and even if there's very short amount of time, even then, if you have learned that it is a crucial thing to always have this significant chunk of your time devoted to that, even if you are under large pressure, you will never give it up and not do it. Um, that's, that's, that's my firm belief. Um, so, but we should prepare people when they are not under that pressure to make it a normal, a normal thing of their, of their, of their life, of their, of their practice. And then in terms of spe very specific tools like this methodology that I showed, MUSAP, we cannot expect every modeler to know how to apply that, how to do that. So for that, we have special teams. We had a special team that I led in the PBL, which was a methodological support team to help modelers do their work. Um, so make it easier. And sometimes we wanted them to fill in this questionnaire of the guidance and they didn't have time. So I went to the project meetings and I facilitated that. So you need to facilitate those discussions by trusted uh, people who have it. Then I had 100% of my time to do this, right? I had the luxury to only focus on quality. And the trick then is to bring that together with the people who are under this intense pressure. Thank you, Art. Thank you. F very practical um, and any the luxury to be, in, to be in that role. Um, we are, have four more minutes be, um, before we have filled up the 90 minutes of the, uh, of the webcast. Um, perhaps this is time to ask the uh, panelists if you have questions to each other. Um, and Arthur, as you just had the floor, perhaps um, can you start? Do we have questions to Veronica? 
uh, or Andrea. You don't have to. And then we. Well, of course, I'm I'm curious, but it takes too long to learn about um, what's happening now and in future within the European Commission in terms of um, providing uh, when people prepare these impact assessments. Uh, providing the training and, and the support to do them well. Um, maybe you can you can say a few things on the basis of a lot of your rejections. You can you will give general advice there as well. So I'm just curious about what's happening there. We don't need to go in depth, but Veronica, it would be interesting to. Do. Well, Veronica just emphasized that she always said teaches people to be concise and have have a good narrative. So I think you can. Can you, can you say a few words on uh, Arthur's question? Yeah, I mean, I mean, this is this is partly why we uh, we devote we we write a serious annual report where we talk about the um, uh, the strengths but also the weaknesses of the impact assessments, um, and the issue is with the commission. You know, the commission is a, an organisation that it tends to be based on generalists with pockets of um, specialist skills around the place. So, uh, but we, we, we do see that um, uh, where we have um, DGs with uh, a lot of impact assessments, we do see a learning effect. Um, we have uh, the Secretariat General who provides, well, this horrible 400 page toolbox, which is being revised. There's a new communication coming out on, um, on better regulation. Uh, we'll try to relaunch the better regulation uh, network of the, the commission again. Um, and I mean, if it hadn't been for the, the pandemic, we had planned for last year to do uh, a tour of DGs to go to senior management level and say to them, these are the things that are important in your impact assessments. Um, I'm going to the DGs meeting uh, tomorrow, virtually, of course, um, and I'm going to tell them we're going to start rejecting impact assessments, which are more than 50 pages long, unless you have come to us beforehand and made an excuse about why it's so complex that you need to have more space and learn about what should be in the main text and what should be put into to, to the annexes. So, I mean, it's an, iterative, it's an iterative process and it'll never be over because staff move about the commission so much but um, at the moment, there is such a focus in the commission on the commission's work program and getting it through that I'm finding more and more uh, the senior managers, the directors general are taking it seriously because they know if they get a negative opinion from us, they're in trouble with their political leaders. So it's tending to feed back into um, more time. So it's 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 not a it's not a scientific. It's more a behavioural kind of approach uh, to it. But it seems I, I'm 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 confident we're getting better. That's an optimistic note. <laughs> Thank you, Veronica. Um, Andrea, uh, do, do you want yeah. to um, <laughs> come in? Uh, perhaps also pose a question to uh, either Veronica or Arthur. Dunk, I wanted to compliment uh, uh, Arti because I like this idea of the facilitator who talks with the modeler and try to extract from them the, this information of which which they have, but they don't know how to uh, mm. give out. And then a proposal for Veronica is uh, uh, which which goes also in the direction of this kind of. Uh, um, diverging epistemologies between social sciences and natural sciences, which is mentioned in the paper uh, uh, authored by Saunders uh, and co-worker. Uh, I think that an example you might want to look at is what um, what we do in Bergen uh, uh, with uh, uh, Jerome van der Sloys and others, where we actually teach issues related to risk, uncertainty, quantification, with examples taken from a variety of fields. And this course, which I think Bajerun can correct me, is called Theory of Science and Ethics, is taught to each and every PhD student, independent of which faculty they come from. And I believe the same course, I mean, maybe this is provocative, but could give to the people in the European Commission, you know, because very often they are not exposed to this kind of uh, knowledge at all, at all. And on the contrary, they are you know, they are instructed to be, you know, quantify, quantify, quantify kind of, you know, marching order. Uh, and so, the, you know, they 
are not exposed to this kind of more reflexive uh, uh, analysis of uh, the pros and cons of different approaches to quantification. Right. Um, thank you, panelists, um, for your opinions and your answers. Um, I'll turn to uh, Sondas, who will um, conclude the, the webcast. I would like to thank all our panelists. Thanks, Veronica, Arthur, and Andrea. It was a very stimulating discussion. I learned a lot, and I'm sure uh, uh, our participants shared the same. And thanks, Ian, for a very interesting talk. And uh, thanks for our three organizers, Sissing, Sesmo, and Thiers. Thanks, Elena and uh, Caroline, for all the support. And big thank you to all our participants who tuned in today from all over the world. Keep well and stay safe. Thank you, everyone.